Uh, we are here in the Jackson County Parks Department Auditorium uh, to present another program in what has become a long series of meetings around the community talking about GMOs. Uh, we're going to have two speakers today, uh, Dr. Ray Seidler and Dr. Steve Strauss. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Seidler. And uh, he's familiar to many, if not most of you. He's spoken a number of times around the county in the last weeks. Uh, he is a former Oregon State University professor and a former senior research scientist with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And his comments are going to be labeled the GMO controversy. Following Dr. Seidler will be Dr. Steve Strauss, who will be introduced separately uh, at that time. So again, thank you all for coming. Uh, forgive me for the delays, but we weren't sure how many people would be here, and uh, we were late getting here as well. Both uh, uh, Steve Strauss and Ray Seidler were at the Rotary meeting earlier today, and I thought I bailed out early enough, but uh, didn't quite make it, so. Not only are we working on our technological expertise, we're working on our time management as well. So please be patient with us. <laughs> Let me now start off with uh, Dr. Seidler. And uh, following him will be uh, Steve Strauss. Dr. Seidler. How many here uh, we're at the previous talk. Not, not many, right? Oh, okay. So I'll make believe in my mind that that didn't happen. I want to, I'm still hearing a little echo. Okay, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me now? Okay, no echo, that's good. Hey, I want to start this by making sure that everyone here knows a little bit about me as Tom started. Uh, uh, I am a scientist, I am retired, I love science, people ask me about my work and the like, I said, that's not work, that's not job, that's my hobby. So there have been some comments uh, from the public that are confused, that uh, think I'm anti-science uh, or whatever, uh, and I just have to tell you that's really far from the truth. Uh, regarding the technology and the methods that Steve and I are going to talk about this afternoon. I too have used them in my laboratory over the years. I've used the methods and I actually, through my technicians and students, we developed some new applications of the methodologies. So, hey, you know, just because I'm retired and I got the old white hair thing going, uh, I am a scientist and I practice very hard for about 35 years. Okay, enough of that. Uh, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you. Try to set the story straight. After about 17 years of commercialization and at least 30 years since Nobel recognition of the scientific work that was started here in the West Coast in California, uh, I don't see any miracle crops out in the field yet and they may be coming. I know they are in the pipeline, but we don't have time for me to try to share and explain to you how difficult it is to get from the laboratory to the greenhouse, to the field, to commercialization. And I don't mean that has anything to do with the regulatory oversight, just the science piece. So where I'm coming from today, I will tell you, I just don't see any differences between conventional farming practices and those practiced by farmers who are growing genetically engineered crops. I don't see any differences in pollution abatements, any unique benefits regarding climate change, drought tolerance, but what I do see, and I think Steve and I agree on this, the management of this technology, as beautiful as it may be with medical applications, it's a mess. I'm not anti-medicine. 
I'm not anti-pharmacy, and I forgot to tell you that I, just yesterday I finished teaching a class uh, at the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at Southern Oregon University, and we talked, the whole class was about techniques in genetic engineering. So am I the world's expert? Heck no. But do I think I know what I'm talking about? You better believe it. First thing I want to talk, uh, uh, start off with is about the patent. Um, are farmers being sued? Are farmers paying up money because they've been experienced, they have experienced innocent infringement? You bet your life to the tune of over $15 million. And that is peanuts to Monsanto, but not so to farmers. And the reason why I even bring that up, in my opinion, that has been done to teach a lesson. Farmers are working through contracts. They are working with seeds they do not own. They are working with material that if their pollen drifts over in another farm, the people on the receiving end are in trouble if they go to sell that material. So cross-pollination may happen, it does happen, and it goes both ways, genetically engineered and ungenetically engineered. But only in one direction is it protected by patent law. Furthermore, in a case going back 10 years ago now, the right to prevent anyone from studying the seeds, the crops associated with that patent is forbidden unless you have a signed agreement with the seed company who owns the patent. And in a way, you know, that shouldn't be too surprising. That's part of patent protection. I develop something, I'm selling something, and I don't want you to ruin it for me by making a mistake in the laboratory if that should happen. So some university professors thought they needed to do some research at Duke University, and Monsanto stepped up and said, no, 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 you can't do that. And they won the lawsuit in federal court. That's one of the reasons why I am going to say, and Steve will differ from me, that the amount of information, technical information, health information, ecological information, is rather limited. What mainstream scientists would want to take a chance? Why? There are plenty of other interesting things to do in your research. And I also want to point out, there are no such things in patent protection as, oh, I'm innocent, I didn't know it came over. Not my fault, it's my farmer's fault. He's the GD, uh, gen genetically engineered farmer guy. I didn't have anything to do with it, it was mother nature. Sorry, no excuse. And what it means in a practical context, your customer may not be able to buy your product. It's not the, man it's not the genetic engineering technique fault. It's the management that tells us that there are people in the world that just don't want to buy these things, right or wrong, good or bad, it's their culture, it's their habitat, and it's their right to say no. And if you try to sell a crop that's been cross-pollinated, you're in trouble. Could be in trouble, I should say, if it's discovered. If you're going to eat your whole crop yourself and don't sell it, no problem. But if you sell it, you're selling somebody else's, somebody else's seed, somebody else's property that's protected. All right, going on. One of the main driving forces for our American farmers and the technology is you're going to increase your yield. Therefore, you're going to make more money. And by God, you've got to know that I don't have any problems with our farmers making more money. I, too, was a hobby farmer, a very serious hobby farmer, on 80 acres, and damn near lost my shirt. That was not my profession. Boy, it's hard work to be a farmer. So if you have a leg up to make money, go for it. And that's what our farmers have done. And let me share with you, you know, I usually just use one slide in this part of my presentation, but I've had some pushback. So I'm going to try for four slides to see if I can convince anyone here of what the yields are like. So I'm going to show you something. First, starting out with a, with a table of data. 
from a corn production contest that's held in the state of Ohio every year. I'm going to show you two years of data that's available. I'm going to show you that the average yield in this contest over two years using 19 varieties of corn was about 220 bushels per acre. Anyone in here know what the average is for corn bushels per acre? 84. Indiana is 165. National average is actually 160. So do they know how to grow corn in Ohio? You better believe it. The average was 220. And they compared non-genetically engineered corn yields with conventional. This is not my number. This is not my they find. Non-GMO average was 221, and the GMO average was 219. Don't get excited. Just because the non-GMO is a higher number, they're the same by any mathematician's book. They're the same. Let's dig down a little deeper into the individual results. So I said that there are 19 varieties used 16 GMO. Well, six varieties of genetically engineered corn yields exceeded that of the non-genetically engineered. Those farmers did better off by paying extra a lot extra for the corn seed, for signing the contract, letting their, having their lawyer interpret the 11 to 14 page seed contract, plus the royalty fees. They better get more yield. And what happened to those folks that were in the rest of the contest? In 10 cases, the GMO yields were less. A little of the yields were more with certain varieties, other varieties a little less, and it all balances out in the end. Okay, Bob Nielsen of the Agronomy Department in Purdue University in Indiana has spent his career studying corn, and he's known as Mr. Corn. And he's taken a lot of data from about 100 and, what is it, 150, 160 years the lifetime of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Again, not his numbers, numbers compiled by the USDA. And I want to point out in this part of the graph, you see all these red boxes? That shows that since World War II, technology has given our farmers the capabilities to produce more corn, more corn, more corn every year since World War II at the rate of about two bushels more per year. That's why this line goes up, and it's two bushels, two bushels, two bushels, on average, every year. The green section up here at the top is genetically engineered corn. And in the same line, with the same slope that started in World War II, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, the line there has the same slope. That means translation. There is no differential increase in the corn yields per year. Not my data, not my comments. It's the U.S. Department of Agriculture records for the whole country. Another study by a friend of mine, and he and I go back many, many years. Did this just go dead? There's another one there. Okay. His name is Jack Heineman. He happens to be at Christ Church University in New Zealand. And he wanted to see what was going on in the United States versus Europe. And let's go through the slide quickly. Uh, the squiggles up and down, up and down, up and down just say that corn yields vary each year due to the weather patterns. The United States is the light uh, line here, up and down, up and down. And you see a bold linear line. He's linearized the data to the best fit over that 50, 60 year period. Initially, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the dash line was the corn yield in the US. It's a little bit better than in Europe, Western Europe. And they kind of cross came together around 1990. And then GMO corn was introduced. And again, the same straight line. The slope has not changed. The rate of change is still there about two bushels per year in Western Europe, two bushels per year increase in the United States. 
they're doing just as good as we are or we're doing just as good as they are if you're from Europe. But there's a little difference here. The corn data from Europe is from non-genetically engineered corn. Their corn is doing just as well as ours. Theirs is not genetically engineered. And finally, and we're all going to laugh at this because Steve just presented data from the same report, another excerpt. And his excerpt is different from mine. I had to laugh, and I'll tell you what's going on here. Two months ago, the USDA issued a 40-page report all about how are we doing with our genetically engineered crops. And in that report, there is a quote I'll offer you. Over the last 15 years of use, GMO, GMO seeds have not been shown to definitively increase yield. In fact, the yields of the BT-resistant, Roundup-resistant seeds may be occasionally lower than the yields of conventional varieties. Got that? That's the U.S. Department of Agriculture report. It is unusual, in my professional opinion, for the world's advocate, leading institution that promotes American farming, to say that something isn't working as good as we thought. I don't know when they've ever said that. But if you read carefully in that report, you can get as confused as I was. Steve chose a statement that says kind of the opposite. Things are going better. How can that be? And my personal take on this is that damn report was so heavily edited. It's confusing for everyone who reads it. And the bottom line, I defer, look at my and think about my previous three slides of published, peer-reviewed, scientific data, 150 years USDA data. You decide whether my comment from the report or Steve's comment from the report is correct based on the scientific data. And I will tell you that there are a lot of references given in that report. Find the report. Read it. Get as confused as you want. Look at the references in the back. And I can tell you that I'm disappointed in those references. They're what we call non-mainstream information. One of them that I found is a talk, like I'm giving now, where somebody is quoted, my yields were beyond comparison with my non-genetically engineered crop neighbors. That kind of stuff. There's another report that says our yields and our experimental studies, how is that phrased? did not show a decline, did not show a decline in year, in yields. Does that mean they were average? They were good? Oh, they didn't show a decline. Did they, did they, were they higher? I don't know. I couldn't find it. Didn't show a decline. And who do you think that publication was from in the USDA report? A seed producer. And the first three initials are MON. Did not show a decline over the yields compared to non genetically engineered. Come on, folks. Think about the data in the published, reviewed literature. Get over it. The, the genes that are moved from the soil bacteria into our <coughs> soy into our cotton, into our canola, into our corn. Don't say, I'm a yield increasing gene, move me over. No, no. They don't do that. It's all about how you manage your crop once you plant those seeds. Sometimes that's out of the hands of the farmer, right? Maybe there's some bad weather 
Maybe there's a drought. Maybe you have a weed infestation. And your neighbor across the street that has a non-GMO crop doesn't have that weed. He's going to do better than you. And vice versa. It all balances out when you look at a large enough national sampling event, my opinion. A lot of underinformation, a lot of cloudy information about toxicology, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I have the answers. But I am a little bit, I am getting a little bit nervous about now four studies that have come out in the last handful of years. So I'm going to bait you to stand by on that, but I want to show you two other slides first. Then I'm going to tell you why I'm a little uneasy, something might be going on that bothers me. So let's start here. I want to draw your attention to this part of the slide, health risk. It's a universal equation that our regulators use, that toxicologists use around the world. And it says, what is the risk all about? It's the toxicity of the chemical times how much you get exposure to. Uh, and this means if you have five units of toxicity and five units of exposure, the risk is not five plus five, the risk is 25. Five times five. And it also says if you have a chemical that is very low in toxicity, eh, you're all right, but you have continual exposure day in and day out, day in and day out. So your exposure part of that equation is up there, it's high. It doesn't take too much toxicity to get a detectable risk. You got that? You know what I'm trying to say here. It's exposure times how hot, how dirty, how bad a chemical is. Let's look at Roundup or glyphosate, the active ingredient. It's everywhere. It's in our air we breathe. It's in the water we drink. It's in the food we consume. It's in our rainwater. So we get a lot of the right side of this equation. We get a lot of exposure. And look at this funny equation that I've got here. The amount in our food means it's greater than in human breast milk, it's greater than in urine, it's greater than in drinking water, and greater than in rainwater. Let's say we excrete it in our urine. The tests have been done. Yes, we do. And do you know the amount we excrete in the United States is 10 times the level that of the Europeans? Why is it 10 times higher here in our country? Do we have exposure? Yeah. Okay. The concentration in breast milk, human breast milk, is 10 times that excreted in our urine. 10 times higher. What does that mean? Possibly. It means that there is a risk of bioaccumulation of glyphosate in fatty tissue. Analogous to other bad chemicals, I won't mention their name, so I don't want to scare you. But it's happened before. We've learned about this kind of a phenomenon. But let me quickly add, and I cannot overemphasize this, the breast milk sample analyses are probably unreliable. I have to tell you there's only 10 samples taken throughout the United States. <coughs> Three of those were positive out of the 10. I'm not going to stake my reputation for whatever that's worth, on trying to emphasize this is something you need to worry about. There's a lot coming out of breast milk. Oh my God, not what I'm saying. I am saying we definitely need to follow up. We need a, sci a planned scientific analysis on the breast milk glyphosate situation. Okay, what am I uneasy about? There are now four scientific studies in the last uh, three years or so, the last one a few months ago, from four different continents, and the scientists from four different continents, North America, South America, Europe, 
and now Asia. And they all are saying, hey, it looks like we are seeing some evidence for, for hormonal disruptive processes in our assays in which we're adding glyphosate. Two of those four studies have been discredited. The other two, not yet discredited. Taken collectively, something might be going on here. Let me show you a little bit about what happens to critters if we take glyphosate out of our food. Let's make believe, okay, we have glyphosate in our food, three to 10 parts per million. We can extract that in a chemically pure state and use it in the artificial conditions and laboratory assays. We find that it kills little fish. It stops the growth of earthworms. These are, I want to emphasize, not field studies, all done in the laboratory. It causes endocrine disruption, hormonal changes in developing frogs. They produce one leg, they produce three legs, and they produce females that have sperm, and they produce male frogs that are making eggs. It's called intersex changes. Exposures to the amount of Roundup in our food. Can we extrapolate frogs? Hey, they're very sensitive to environmental perturbations. That's why scientists use them. They drink through their skin, so any little bit of toxic stuff is going to hit them pretty hard. So to extrapolate from a frog to a human, I don't think there's a mainstream scientist that walks the planet that's going to say, oh yeah, it's going to get to you. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is here's some evidence from scientists in four different countries that are trying to say they're picking up on something. They see some changes in multiplication of human breast cancer. They see some changes in hormonal imbalances in frogs. They see deaths in young fish. All of this is artifactual. All of this is mistake, errors. All of this is junk science. Personally, I don't think so. Are we ready to announce to our regulators they've made another mistake? Like with DDT, PCB, thalidomide, uh, hormone replacement therapy, uh, testosterone therapy. This is added to the list. No, we're not there. But I'm beginning to see a flag go up, and I'm a little nervous about that. And I can be criticized for being nervous, but I'm ready. Okay, golden rice syndrome, I call it. What a mother mess. There are people by the millions, youngsters and pregnant women in the world, that are waiting for this genetically engineered rice to appear on their breakfast table. Because in the part of the world where they live and their diet is short of an essential nutrient for normal development of a human being, and that's vitamin A. Can't, we can't live without it. So scientists have been working at least 20 years to figure out how to add vitamin A to <clears throat> rice. And it's called golden rice because of a pigment that our scientists, not Americans, but the scientists, have learned to add through genetic engineering. And it produces a pigment. It's yellow. That's why we call it golden rice. But I have to say a couple of things that are very disturbing. It's taken a long time, and those that are pro-GMO advocates, this is the beginning of a new world, etc., are saying the regulators are holding this up while children are dying out there. Give me a break. It's not just the regulators that are involved, and they should be, and I'll tell you why in a moment. I have to recover from that excitement. <laughs> Do you think that humanity is sitting on their hands letting this happen while we're waiting for 
something that may or may not come along, that may or may not work. The pro-GMO folks do not tip their hats to the thousands of volunteers that are out there at this moment in Africa and in Southeast Asia working through the World Health Organization providing a separate mechanism for giving these people vitamin A. Volunteers have been doing this successfully since 1982. Nobody's sitting waiting for golden corn that is held up by regulators. No, 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 no. Let's tip our hats to those volunteers that are out there saving lives. Do you ever hear about something called vitamin A toxicity? Mm -hmm. Well, here's some rice. This is the non-genetically engineered. This is the yellow uh, phase one, and this is the darker phase two rice that is producing still higher amounts of vitamin A. Too much of a good thing is bad. And let me tell you and present and offer these comments. Some of the reasons why we're waiting so long for the golden rice to hit the plate of these people involve mistakes made by molecular biologists and using the wrong varieties of culturally acceptable rice, followed by just its tough science. This has never been done before. Followed by, geez, what we got in here is not stable, it's not high enough, you got to eat this much rice, so let's put more gene activity in. That's okay, that's a learning curve. That's how science works and develops. But in my estimation, vitamin A, because it has medical risks if you overdose, should be treated as a pharmaceutical, not as a food additive, because it can kill you. What the heck am I talking about? Excuse the technicalities here. But basically what I want to tell you is that beta carotene is the golden colored material that is being produced in golden rice. Not vitamin A. But through a series of about three steps in the human body, when this beta carotene is consumed, it produces something called retinol, which is the vitamin A. So as you increase the beta carotene, you get more vitamin A. So if you go really high on the yellow stuff, beta carotene, you can over, you, there is a risk of overdosing on vitamin A. If you overdose on vitamin A, it knocks out the biological activity of another vitamin called vitamin D. No, vitamin D is in our milk. It's in there for a reason. It prevents osteoporosis. It prevents brittling of the bones. So if you have a pregnant woman who's breastfeeding, or uh, I'm sorry, if you have a lady who's breastfeeding uh, and she's overdosed on vitamin A, uh, there's a risk of bone brittling activity. On the other end of things, this intermediate compound called retinoic acid is something scientists call a teratogen. That means it causes birth defects. Remember what happened to thalidomide babies? That's the kind of birth defect, birth defect that'll happen with retinoic acid. So I'm saying be patient with the golden rice development. It's complicated. It's complicated from a genetic engineering perspective. It's complicated from a agricultural perspective and from a medical perspective for overdosing. Be patient. Maybe it'll come someday. And in the meantime, folks who are working with the World Health Organization say in their rounds in, in Africa and in Europe, what about growing garden foods? What about leafy vegetables? What about sweet potatoes, radish leaves, curry plant leaves, tomatoes, and amaranth? All, wow, natural, beautiful sources of vitamin A. None of it's genetically engineered. Steve talks about the beautiful engineering that's done with tomatoes. We don't need genetic engineering at all to produce these kinds of tomatoes that are full 
uh, of beta carotene and other antioxidants. Those are available, they're called heirloom tomatoes. They're available from the supplier right now today who lives in Jackson County. Why do we need it genetically engineered? Well, maybe somebody needs a patent. Here's what happens through that Helen Keller International Institute. Their volunteers last year reached 50 million children. Hats off to those volunteers. 50 million children who received their vitamin A through two drops in a pill, and it's only given twice a year. Not every day, two times a year. 50 cents a dose. 50 cents a dose. Okay, moving on. We've got to talk about cross-pollination before I'm done. Uh, it's a natural process. It goes in both directions. That is to say, if this is a genetically engineered corn, for example, and this is not, the pollen drifts both directions. Of course it does. What's all the fuss? Well, there are people, societies, cultures in the world that say if this happens from left to right, genetically engineered crop to none, it's not a natural process to them. It is contaminated and we just don't want it. We don't want that. Sorry. So if we have a farmer who's in this business of trying to grow some kind of a seed crop and it gets cross-pollinated, it can be detected at least down to one in a thousand seeds or even finer than that. It can be detected. Pollen coming from the non-GE crop to the GE crop, you can't detect it. You can't measure it. Nobody cares if that's happened. People who eat the genetically engineered seeds or wherever they go, don't mind if there's a one in a thousand cross-pollination events. It's not costing that producer any money. But if it goes the other way, it's own patented material. The genes that are in the pollen are owned by the seed company, not by the farmer. And the farmer is fine, as I said earlier. No problem. If you want to eat all your crop, go ahead. Oh, you want to sell it. That's where I'm going to get you if I'm a Monsanto attorney. If I can detect it, and if I suspect for some reason I have the right to test your crop, to see if you have DNA, if you have genes there, that's that belongs to me, not to you. If you're going to sell it, make a profit, Hey, that's where I want to be. That's my material. That's part of this ugliness, of this management problem that we're all facing. It's ugly. Sure, 10,000 years that's been going on. We've been genetically engineering seeds 17 years. It's a new problem. Cross-pollination. <coughs> What do you think might happen if it goes on with golden rice, which is a pharmaceutical product? I told you what overdoses could be. <coughs> what do you think has happened to heritage corn varieties in our neighbor to the south? Last week we heard that corn to them, I can't even describe what it means to their culture. I don't know of an equivalent thing in the United States, except maybe American Frankfurters. Hot dogs? I don't know. But to the Mexican, the corn is part of their heritage, their life, their country. And they have this beautiful phrase, si maiz no hay país. Without our corn, there's no country. That's how deeply they feel. And they had Monsanto corn cross-pollinate with some of their heritage corn. Very disturbing. So disturbing that, yeah, activists, let's call them what they are, political activists in their country, along with their scientists, 
who have come to UC Berkeley to study the issue have filed a class action suit, the third one in the history of the country of Mexico, and they've stopped any further importation of corn from American farmers. Okay. I see you. <laughs> you know, Steve talked a half an hour over. Uh, let, me, let me quickly finish. Our colleague at Oregon State University, Carol Mallory Smith, said, we can't contain genes because that's not how biology works. Get over it. It's a natural phenomenon. And even if it's not pollen, it can be seeds that are one time, two times, three times, four times removed from the control of the farmer, like has happened in Canada with flax, like has happened recently in the United States with trying to get Syngenta corn into China. Didn't work. And I'm not even need to talk to you about this, but it's not as just impacted farm, wheat farmers in eastern Oregon. It's impacted a Jackson County farmer to the tune of at least $50,000 who lost his wheat crop while the big boys were trying to figure out what to do about this little plant contamination in eastern Oregon. And it didn't take two months, Steve. It took four to five months to work out. This is how I envision our agriculture. Scientists from around the world wrote a report, said this can't continue. It's not sustainable. You can't continue to do this and save the environment and make a profit. What are we going to do? And here I answers a question to a last slide, I promise. Folks that grow grapes for wine production in Oregon, California, Jackson County has said, hey, you know, if this thing passes, I'm not going to be able to look forward to growing genetically engineered grapes. I understand. I relate to that. Is it a valid concern, though? If you had a choice, a Pinot Noir and a Pinot Noir, one was made from genetically engineered grapes, one not, which one would you choose? Which one would you choose? First risk. And why not use genetic engineering techniques to say, I wonder if I can detect some mold-resistant genes in wild natural populations of grapes. Ah, oh, there's a resistant gene. It's going to kill my fungus. And all i got to do is genetically engineer it in, into my grape, and then I don't have to use my chemicals, right? But what if I told this person that scientists in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and at Cornell University in an international conference that just took place said, we don't need to do it by genetic engineering. We can do it by conventional crossbreeding that's been practiced for hundreds of years. And that's what those scientists, government scientists, Cornell University scientists are up to doing. What's wrong with that? Okay, I think on that I better stop before I get thrown out. Thanks for your time. I understand. No problem. Yeah, both of them have a presentation at six o'clock up in Grants Pass, so we wanted to make sure that we have um, a little bit of time for questions afterwards too. So that's why I was pushing them. So. Um, our next speaker, I'm, I'm just going to do it real brief, because you can fill in fill in any holes that you need to. But um, Dr. Steven Strauss is a distinguished professor of forest biotechnology in the Department of Forest Science at Oregon State University. He also has a joint appointment in the molecular, I can't even say it, molecular and cellular biology program. So his presentation is entitled GMO Crops Taking the Long View. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much for coming out here. I appreciate it. So some stuff that Ray said I agree with, some of it I dramatically disagree with, and I'll try to state some of those points of disagreement as we go along here, and maybe at the end uh, try to, uh, I have some notes there, try to deal with them one by one. So um, 
First thing I want to do is put up some qualifications. Uh, I've seen some things on the internet lately. I'm not paid by any ag biotech companies to be here. I'm not getting funding from them. Uh, not even car fare, nothing. I'm just here because I want to provide whatever information would help you guys make your decision. I'm not representing Oregon State University. I'm a professor there, but it's me giving my view. Uh, you'll see I'm favorable to GMOs as a tool. I think Ray was as well. Uh, but I don't endorse all GMO crops or all the practices using them. That's a major point of agreement. We should be doing much better than we're doing with them. Um, I value organic agriculture as a choice for consumers. I don't see, from a science point of view, any fundamental problem. It's a market regulation issue. We can coexist scientifically, no problem. But obviously, uh, for, pe for people who grow it and grow into markets, uh, there are real financial pains. There can be. A lot of them have not been measured yet, but I think they're real, and I think we need to find solutions for that. And I appreciate that's a serious issue for farmers who might get the value of their crop reduced or rejected as a result of contamination. I think that's a, a point of agreement. And so we need choices. The governor of Oregon uh, recently established a GMO task force that I'm on, and there's a lot of organic agriculture folks on it as well as conventional, and we're trying to come up with advice for him about what might be workable solutions. But when the governor met with us a couple of weeks ago, his comment was, I don't expect consensus. I expect some general ideas, because this area is so divisive, there's probably no simple paths forward. Um, so my focus is on science, not law or economics. I'm going to try to avoid value judgments to the extent that I can and say whether something is good or bad. I'm sure that I won't be perfect there. Um, and I'm also going to talk about broader stuff, like Ray did with golden rice, because I think the message Jackson County and Oregon sends to the world about this is important. It's significant. That's maybe far more significant than whatever happens locally. So I think we need to keep the big picture in mind. So these are my key messages. If you want to go to sleep after this and explain yourself the details, you can do that. Uh, GMOs are not one thing. So there's, there's consensus about that worldwide, ecologists, crop scientists, you name it, uh, they say look at it case by case. Don't adopt them uh, happily, don't throw them out as a group. Of course, you're talking about throwing them out as a group. So from a strict science perspective, that is against scientific consensus. But that doesn't mean it's not, doesn't make sense economically or on other basis. But from a science point of view, uh, that does not make sense. And there's good consensus on that. Uh, as Ray also said, I think is correct, it's really helpful to separate the science of doing it, the technology of accomplishing something, higher antioxidants, whatever it might be, from how you manage it, how you regulate it. And again, the question, this is sort of a baby and bathwater question. If you've created something that's good, but you're not managing it that well, do you want to throw it away because the bathwater is dirty? Um, as you'll see, I, I think it's important to consider the context. We do crazy stuff in conventional breeding all the time. Some of those genes that Ray was talking about coming from grapes, that often involves very wide crosses and a lot of chromosomal disruption and duplication and doubling. I'll show you a couple of examples. So GMOs are sometimes viewed as this radical departure in breeding, and in a lot of ways there's a lot of similarities, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there's a lot of sensationalized science, I have to say. Sorry, Ray, but I think you showed us some of that. Um, there's a lot of internet myths out there. And so we've got to be really cautious about what we get from the internet, what we get from groups that are rapidly anti-GMO as a matter of philosophy. From my point of view, uh, the answer is to try to coexist, to try to seek solutions that preserve freedom to farm for everybody, and I'll come back to that very briefly at the end. So this is what I want to cover here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I might know something about this. You, you can be the judge at the end. Talk about GMOs relative to conventional breeding. Talk about the record in summary in the world and in the United States. Uh, talk about the problems in management, which have been significant, as Ray said. Talk about is GE food safe? What do we think? That's the biggest issue to consumers. And then, again, coexistence. So who am I? Um, I do research on cottonwood trees. These are, as long as you, know, you, know, you harvest them before 12 or 14 years, these are agricultural crops in Oregon. So I'm an agricultural geneticist and biotechnologist in that sense, though I'm in the College of Forestry at Oregon State, that's the box. But I basically do ag biotech with these trees. 
and I've been doing that for a lot of years, both conventional genetics, genomics, and genetic engineering. Um, for eight years, I was director of an outreach and biotech program based at Oregon State, based in the College of Agricultural Sciences, where among other things, we had a lecture series and brought in all kinds of great speakers, including ecologists and environmentalists and organic farmers, to talk about these issues and what's true and what's not true and pass forward. So that's given me a fair bit of familiarity with the issue. And then I'm sort of a mini farmer. I've been doing field trials of different kinds of poplars up to about 10 acres uh, uh, of experimentation. So I have some understanding of what farmers deal with in trying to manage weeds, manage irrigation, manage insect pests. And I know, as Ray said, how very difficult it can be. Um, so what are GMOs? Uh, let's talk about conventional breeding some. So a lot of the crops we have, I think there's one one general misunderstanding among the general public often is that you know crops are natural and GMOs are unnatural. Well, in fact, many of the crops we have have been radically modified in their chemistry and their behavior and their genetic constitution. Uh, some of the most prominent examples are corn from may, you know, may, maize, uh, which in its natural form is teosinte is essentially inedible. So this really is a genetic creation through earlier methods, not genetic engineering, but uh, earlier pre-scientific methods, in fact. Banana is another one that's an extra chromosome, triploidy, so chromosome engineering, making it sterile so you don't have the seeds that otherwise make it inedible. And we could talk more about these other crops that the wild relatives are often poisonous, toxic, extremely low yielding, radical changes in their chromosomes, chromosomal constitution, gene additions, gene deletions, and so forth. Um, another example is the brassicas where you have things like broccoli and cauliflower that again, due to a few genes in this case that we've now characterized, true mutants, natural mutants, who created these amazingly nutritious crops that uh, the only thing left to do, I think, is to figure out how to add a gene to get kids to like to eat them. <laughs> haven't, haven't figured that one out yet. But again, radical genetic engineering. And uh, sometimes when we don't have the diversity, when we scan all kinds of species, anything we can make a cross between, often on different continents with different chromosomal constitutions, we do embryo rescue and all kinds of very unnatural things to, uh, to produce these mutants, sometimes we resort to irradiation or mutagenesis with chemicals to try to produce more mutant varieties. And those, of course, are not discriminant. Those are mutating the whole genome and trying to sort through it. So about 2,000 crop varieties have derived from this. So apart from knowing this is kind of a comparative baseline, so we don't uh, disproportionately at least freak out about GMOs, uh, some of these techniques overlap with what's in the ballot measure as I read it, where we talk about we shouldn't do unnatural gene doubling, gene deletion, chromosomal changes. Well, we, don't, well, we already have been doing that kind of thing. And so it's not clear to me legally if they've drawn the line properly. So one of the problems you may have with the ballot measure is how it's interpreted and whether there's legal fights over whether some of the mutated crops grown in organic agriculture might be classified as GMOs. I'm not sure. I read the measure again yesterday and this morning, and I, I think it's ambiguous, but that's up to lawyers to make the final decision about. So grafting is another one. We now know when you graft, a little bit of DNA moves from the graft up into the scion. Is that an unnatural genetic modification? That would obviously affect organic growers if you do grafting, like in apple and pear orchards. So concerns that maybe the ballot measure wasn't written quite right, which would be a real concern to implementation and the cost thereof. So uh, final message is that this stuff I've been telling you about is not the past, and we don't do that anymore. We still do radical genetics all the time, and it's picking up in speed. The ability to sequence genomes cheaply and rapidly we can scan genomes of all kinds of species that would never mate with a crop normally, find just the individual genes, move them in, change whole genomes much faster than ever before. So if genetics worries you, and indeed, lots of the wild relatives of crops are highly toxic and maladapted. Uh, we're doing stuff, stuff that would give a scientist concern. Scientists generally don't worry about the method as much as they worry about the consequences, the chemistry, the safety. Uh, um, and that's kind of the baseline, that we do a lot of crazy stuff. And, you know, and, and right now, there's no regulation anywhere in the world about it. Maybe Canada would be a minor exception, because Canada regulates not based on the method, but based on its novelty. The rest of the world is hung up on the method. 
And I would say mainly for political reasons, Ray, but also for cultural reasons. So there's the question. Will any of these things be restricted by the ballot measure? Unclear, but I think it's a serious question. Is that somebody's phone? Yeah. Somebody disagreeing with me already? <laughs> so what is genetic engineering? Good to have clear. Genetic engineering is not taking a gene from some faraway place and moving it. It's that and it's a lot of other things. It's basically the conventional breeding. We cross stuff. These are chromosomes. They recombine. We're often crossing stuff, as I said, from all over the place because we want to get maximum diversity and then sort through all this diversity. With genetic engineering, we figure out how the trait works, isolate the gene, modify it, and then asexually introduce it. And I'll show you as we go along, there's a lot of interest because breeding of some of our crops naturally can be very difficult for using the GMO process to move and modify natural genes and get desirable traits. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So again, it's the method, and the method is definitely useful and increases efficiency in a number of cases. So uh, it's not always taking a gene from a, a, a wild place. So this is what it looks like. These are from poplar trees in my own laboratory. You, through tricks of science, you insert a gene into an individual somatic cell. You induce it by your tissue culture conditions to regenerate into a plant. So from a single cell, you get a shoot. Sometimes you have a shoot in the root at the same time. It has a new gene in every cell. And then through routine, uh, horticulture, you put roots on and you acclimate it to soil, you vegetatively propagate it or you go through seeds and you put it out in the field and see if it's healthy and normal and gives you the trait you wanted. These are two cottonwood trees that differ. One of them is transgenic and one of them are the controls and there was no obvious expression differences of the trait this particular year, so they look the same. But that's what it looks like. So uh, when you do genetic engineering, you tend to modify a few genes. So organisms have 20, 50,000 depending on the size of the genome, you're modifying a very, very few. Something like uh, one foot of DNA is changed between Corvallis and Seattle, just to give you some sense of scale for the size of the genome. So you're really tinkering. You're not engineering like you're building a new bridge engineering. You're tinkering at the margins of this amazing complex organism. We're not creating new organisms, novel things. And that's also a common public misunderstanding. So GE record and brief around the world and, uh, and, a look, and, look, and looking at some traits that are just here or coming beside, beside the big ones, that would all be precluded by the ballot measure. So as Ray did, I'm going to depend a little bit on this report, and I'll scrutinize some of the things he said, I think, as we go, because I'm not trying to selectively take out quotes that mislead, not at all. Um, so I think this is a credible, very recent report about the state in the USA. And on, a, on an international uh, scale, this group Based at Cornell, it's a nonprofit that tries to track what's going on globally. So we'll look at both a little bit. And those are the two main sources of information. So when you look around the world, since about 1996, you've had this uptake of GE crops. This is about 25 countries that are doing it. And it's called the most rapidly adopted innovation in the history of agriculture. Faster than hybrid corn, faster than the plow. So there's a lot of farmers who think there's value here. Um, interestingly, the amount of uh, land in the developing world, places like India and China, now slightly outpace that in the developed world, places like Canada and the United States. So the notion that these crops are just for mega agriculture and agribusiness, we know is now flat wrong. A lot of these are very small farmers growing small plots of land. So when you look globally, uh, how much land this is, it's something like 10 to 15% of all the la arable land on the planet. So plowed land, arable land is what I mean by that. So it's not a new, novel, crazy thing. It's not something that most everybody rejects because it's done on a massive scale around the world. There are many countries that are having trouble with it, including in Europe, obviously, as you know. But it's already very, very big. So we have to recognize, in my opinion, that there are a lot of people who think this is OK and good and valuable. And the real issue is coexistence as we go forward. So two traits dominate. I think you know herbicide tolerance, mostly Roundup, but also other herbicides. And insect resistance, mostly the BT gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, widely used as an organic pesticide. But now taking the pesticide out of the bacterium and putting it into the plant. So you have to bite the plant to get the toxin. And we can talk about that in detail. Um, a lot of now, increasingly, 90% of the corn now have stacked traits, meaning they have 
uh, two or more genes, often more than one insect resistance gene to give more robust resistance or resistance to more pests. So, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, I'm not going to get into the details here, but so this amazing uptake is occurring despite about a 50% increase in the price. So farmers, uh, I, I don't think of farmers as dumb. I, dumb, I think of them as being very conservative and practical, are paying quite a bit more for that. So the assumption is they're perceiving that there's value. So a lot of what you see in the internet is very, very negative. Uh, Ray cited a number of those, you know, what I would consider to be stream, extreme negative websites as sources of his information. I, I, I tend to not believe what I see there. I try to go to places like this, the mainstream scientific uh, uh, um, journals and places like the National Academy of Sciences that tries to put together diverse groups of the top scientists to assess a complex issue. So these have both concluded largely that there have been very large positive environmental impacts to date of, of GE crops. And there's also problems, and I'll talk about that as we, as we go along. But the message is, in my view, mostly positive so far. And it's for two reasons. One is, for these insect-resistant crops, a rather dramatic reduction in the use of insecticides. And this is from that USDA report, so you can see it yourself. You can see it's variable up and down. But the report says that this is mainly due to insect-resistant GE crops, that you've got this reduction. And because these crops are so widely grown and they use quite a lot of insecticides, particularly cotton, uh, it's a big reduction in active ingredient of insecticides. It's a big environmental benefit, not a little one. The other benefit that's talked about widely is the uh, promotion of no or low-till agriculture by herbicide-resistant crops. And I think there's a scientific consensus that no or low-till is good. Tillage disturbs the soil, disturbs wildlife habitat, makes soils prone to erosion, compacts the soil, uh, uh, reduces organic matter as it helps the oxidation, and all of that driving over the soils, plowing them, uh, plowing them up, releases more greenhouse gases to the environment. The ISAA globally estimated that in 2012, the increased no-till, no and low-till, was uh, equivalent to 13 million cars off the road. So it's a pretty big deal. So this is the other major advantage, and, uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that. So this is from the, the, the uh, report, and uh, the, the amount of uh, use, the amount to which conservation tillage is, is promoted by GE varies from crop to crop and year to year. This is soybean, and so here what you see is this is conventional tillage. These are conventional varieties, so mostly conventional tillage. When you have conventional varieties, you have herbicide tolerant varieties, you have relatively little conventional tillage, and lots and lots of no-till. So that's the, that's the data they're talking about, that it promotes it. It's not essential for it, but it makes it easier for farmers to do it, for obvious reasons. So yield is a place that Ray and I differ. And the first thing to say is that these genes were not put in there to increase yield. So to put up yield as a straw man and say, see, we didn't do it. These are not yield genes. These don't improve intrinsic yield. They were there to increase the efficiency of management, and reduce costs, reduce use of things like pesticides, promote use of things like herbicides that are more effective or uh, have lower environmental impact. Now, it's not surprising you have a little bit of yield benefit if you do control pests a little better, but usually you're doing other things instead, like using more insecticides, like you just saw. So the yield might be the same. So this is a, uh, a paper that looked very rigorous. I read it carefully. Uh, looked at several hundred studies early in the adoption of GMO. When you're first adopting it around the world, you farmers will have a GMO and a non-GMO. Now in most places, it's all GMO, and it's hard to make a comparison. So this is the very first kinds of very first look at what the benefits might be. So you can read this, and there's many cases where the yields are negative, many cases where they're positive. On net, over all the studies, the yield benefit in, in the uh, developed countries like the U.S. was positive, about six percent. Not impressive, but pretty good when you don't expect really any. That's not why these genes were put in there. When you look in the developing countries, the yield benefits very big, 30%. Because in many cases, this is the way you're controlling pests, having the technology, particularly BT, whereas you weren't doing it or doing it very ineffectively otherwise. When you look at who is uh, benefiting in the developing world, 
uh, a lot of the women do agriculture, and they were the ones who got the most personal benefit in terms of the time it took, the toil it took, and so forth, the amount of pesticide they were exposed to uh, compared to men. So it looked like there was a sociological benefit. So in the USDA report, and we'll talk about it in the details, so this is what it says. So now I told you we have stack traits. And they say that the yield advantage, so they say there is a yield advantage of BT corn and BT cotton over conventional seed has become larger in recent years. It already exists, it's become larger as these traits have become incorporated in stack. So multiple genes, not really surprising. Another thing is GMOs have advanced. We're getting the genes into better backgrounds. These genes are bred. The early is they are often in genetic backgrounds that weren't the very best varieties because that takes time to do the breeding. That's probably another reason it's getting better. And so they say planting BT corn and BT cotton continues to be more profitable as measured by net returns than planting conventional seeds. One other important difference when you think about yield, and you saw this in Ray's quote, they talk about yield potential. That's the inherent potential. Once you remove all the pests and limiting factors, and we agree that's not what these genes have been about. These genes are not about increasing intrinsic yield, yield potential. They've been about uh, um, helping management and, and increasing net yield, which includes the, the hazards, the things that might harm a plant. So intrinsic yield, we have no yield genes in plants yet that I know about. And that's hard to do, and I think most breeders would say conventional breeding is the way to do that because it's very, very complex. But things, obviously, when you remove a disease pressure, as we'll say in papaya dramatically, obviously yield is affected as well, but we don't call it yield potential. And Ray's quote was talking about yield potential, so that's a very different thing. So in that same report, there were survey data that were reported by use, and it simply asked farmers, why do you grow these things? They, obviously, they cost you more. And, and with, without regard to the particular gene, herbicide tolerance, BT, insect tolerance, or the crop, the large majority of farmers say it's for yield benefit. So they perceive it. It's often hard to measure, particularly these days, that everything seems, seems to be GMO for a lot of these farmers, um, but they perceive a yield benefit. So I believe there is one, even though that was not the main goal. So at a global level, stepping back, ISSA, this is what they estimate as farm gate value. Uh, about $117 billion, and they estimate that the farmers in the developing world have done this, that there's about 16 million of them. If you include their families, that's 65 million who have significantly benefited economically from the higher efficiency, higher productivity, lower insecticide use for the BT crops. So uh, that's big in my view. So what I have here coming up, I'm going to go through this quickly because there's not much time, is you know, it's not all about herbicide tolerance and BT. And I, I agree with Ray, as you'll see, that, that we really haven't managed the herbicide tolerant crops very well. There's a lot of other stuff that's being produced with GMO technology that would all be foreclosed by the measure. So uh, things like papaya, putting a little bit of DNA from the virus in, immunizes the plant in a way analogous to vaccination, but different detailed scientific mechanism literally saved the papaya industry from ring spot virus that was epidemic. So, and that's been done now in plums, and that's been used in many crops to modify their composition. I'll show you an example or two. Uh, drought tolerance, obviously drought is a huge issue. Whether you, whatever you believe is causing climate change, you, uh, uh, we tend to agree that the climate's gonna get droughtier in most places in the, in the summer, more variable. And so uh, conventional breeding is work, uh, conventional breeders are working hard to try to produce more robust crops. God bless them. Uh, can you supplement that with GMOs? And it looks like, according to DuPont and Monsanto, that you can. And so they have genes, not on a large scale, and I don't think we really know the answer as to whether they're really useful or not. Uh, every year, droughts are different. Plants experience them differently depending on the soil, depending on the time of year they happen. So it takes many years of data to figure out if these things are really helping or not. But uh, these companies think that GMOs also have some tools that may help plants survive and produce under, under se severe droughts. These are also been provided free of charge. In Africa, I understand, because Africa is almost perpetually under drought, many parts of it. And so I think that's a humanitarian gesture by these companies. Um, Purple tomatoes, you, I, uh, Ray said, and I, I'll mention here, my colleague at Oregon State, Jim Myers, has released these purple tomatoes. You can buy them now. 
there's a variety that's been produced through, through GM techniques that is more purple, it's purple throughout the skin, has higher levels of these same antioxidants, uh, high enough that we now know that it helps them resist uh, rot, so they last longer. They're healthier, presumably, in terms of anthocyanin levels, and they don't rot as fast, as you can see in this image. Now, at least for me, that's what happens to about half of my beloved cherry tomatoes, whether I grow them or whether I buy them at the farmer's market. So this would seem to be something that might be really useful. And maybe you can do it through conventional breeding if you work hard enough, but it's a lot easier and more efficient with GMOs. That's a, so that may come on the market in a couple of years. Um, by turning down the gene using that same vaccination-like technology, uh, we've been able to produce soy oils that look like they're much healthier for several reasons. They resemble olive oil a lot, and that may come in the market this year for the first time. Uh, another kind of soy oil modification done by the big companies is to uh, produce uh, higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, which we think uh, promote uh, brain health and heart health. So that also might be nice to have a healthier soy available routinely. A uh, company uh, in Idaho, Simplot, they have a little division called Simplot Class Sciences, which is devoted to modifying potato using potato genes, not introducing genes from afar, for the reasons Ray mentioned that many people just don't like it. And so they're just using potato genes, turning them down, or bringing in genes from wild relatives. So here you see a case where they've uh, turned down a gene that causes browning and causes a lot of potatoes to be disposed of. As you may know, food waste is one of the biggest environmental problems we have. And then also turns down um, a chemical in them that when you fry them, produces acrylamide. And then you know it's a very, very toxic component of food, so it reduces it uh, much lower, and that's what you see right here compared to conventional potatoes. And because of the GMO technique, you can do this in established potato varieties. Farmers know, McDonald's knows, the public knows. You don't need to rebreed from scratch. And breeding potatoes is very, very difficult because of their sterility or near sterility. So it's much faster as well as more precise. So the other thing that they're saying is in second generation, should be out in a couple of years, they've taken a gene from a wild potato for late blight resistance. So this is a devastating disease. Lots of fungicides are used now in the large majority of potato production. But presumably you would not need to, to, to use at all if you had this, this gene or this gene and other genes that will eventually come with this technique. And this late blight is, was the causative agent of, uh, of uh, the potato famine blight. This is a disease that caused the devastation in Idaho. So it's always been a big one for potato growers. So again, even though this is a native gene, it could be bred in. It would be very difficult and time consuming. With the GM technique, you can grab it, map it, grab it, insert it, and put it right in. So much more efficient. They also put in a gene that reduces production of sugar during uh, storage of potatoes that causes premature spr uh, sprouting and therefore a lot of waste of potatoes. A little closer to my heart is a tree guy. Uh, we have lots of tree diseases. We have them here. Things like sudden oak death. We have them in the hills. All kinds of syndromes. And the best known one is something called chestnut blight that actually devastated chestnut throughout its range. Gorgeous forests of trees that look like this ended up looking like this starting in about 1912. And we've been trying to breed resistance for nearly 100 years. There's actually some great signs that we're getting close with conventional breeding. It's very slow, making hybrids with Chinese chestnut and many generations of back crossing. And there's a gene for resistance from wheat that we've been eating all along that looks like it gets right at the mechanism. So can we use this gene to give a broader base of resistance, use both conventional breeding and genetic engineering? And so one thing I'll just ask you, uh, uh, so this, this is not like the other applications that are about farms or plantations or, or orchards. This is about helping restore a wild tree. This is about producing a resistant chestnut using genetic engineering and breeding and then releasing it into the wild. And my question for you is, do you support that? Would you accept the transgenic blight resistant chestnut for restoration or would you not? I just wonder how many people would support it. Anybody? I want to know if uh, yeah. the seeds that fall from that tree will grow. They will grow. That's actually been established. They're not, they're not uh, sterile. They're not sterile. There's no sterile crops grown anywhere in the whole world. 
that kind of technology has been developed to a limited extent and then abandoned by Monsanto and the other companies is socially unacceptable at this point. So they would be perfectly fertile. Well, I've and heard of situations where that was the case. Yeah, well, it's not true. I mean, through conventional breeding, we breed hybrid. What's that? They were before, but not now. It was just in a laboratory. It never got out into the marketplace, period. But you have things like banana that is essentially sterile, but that's conventional breeding. Exactly. You have hybrid corn that's not sterile, but the corn is so variable, nobody saves the seed, or very few farmers, if some do. So those are kind of conventional sterility-like. But in genetic engineering, no one's done it, because it's not acceptable right now. But in foreign countries, no. it's a thing that they do is save seeds often. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think it's a bad business model to uh, try to sell seed to a place where people don't have the money to buy them. So the notion that we're going to take over the developing world by making their seeds sterile and forcing them to buy it when these folks are too poor anyway, that's doesn't really that's quite make sense. Yeah, and that's not, as far as I know, that's not going on. So, you know, the golden rice that Ray talked about, very different takes on it. There's nonprofits like the Gates Foundation funding the ability to give it away to, for free to farmers. That, that's, that's how golden rice is going to largely be used. No, some people do. That's the, that's the small minority in the developed world. No, in Jackson County, we say. Corn yeah, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. So we have the $10,000 contract this year for corn seeds. So yeah, right. No, my, my, thank you. I didn't know you were here. Yeah, so that's definitely done. I don't know what proportion of the corn is in the United States. I would guess less than 1%. So that's why I kind of didn't treat it. So I might, my apologies. So anyway, I, I, anybody who, who, who would not accept uh, transgenic bite resistant chestnut? Please. Thank you very much. So I'm going to guess that's 10%, something like that. 15%? Go ahead. 20%? I don't know. Yeah, this is, a, this is, no, this is a very scientific study we have going on here. Yeah, I know. I, I, I understand. Right. Show me a picture of a tree, and then you would say, would you accept it? Well, that's the same thing that's happening to our food. No. Yeah, so that, that's how you vote, and that's fine. And I'm guessing it was like 80, 20 based on this. This, this, this rigorous scientific study, 80, uh, 79, 21. I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense. I've been doing this in my talks lately. To get a sense, I, I did it in Eugene. It was about 90, 10, 80, 20. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, what people accept in concept, given the cultural barriers and other concerns people have about GMOs, is it just off the table? That's really what I'm getting at. Anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked into this. I apologize for this uh, rigorous study, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it, I assure you. I'm just trying to get a sense of where people are at in my different audiences, that's all. So far, the majority are okay with it, but obviously we need to know a lot more you know, to make a real decision, no question about it. It's 2020. So golden rice, so golden rice, in contrast to what Ray said, is not crazy and novel. We're doing biofortification with things like golden rice already produced using conventional genetics. And you already heard from him, the goal is to produce beta carotene to deal with nutrient deficiency. Why do you want to do that? Because despite the supplements we're doing, and by the way, the Helen Keller Foundation is collaborating on golden rice because they believe it, Ray. They believe it can be an important part of the solution because the supplements don't fully work. A lot of these places don't even have roads that you can drive on much of the year, let alone, let alone literal, uh, literate people. So the reason that to develop this as another tool there are no silver bullets out there in the world, as I think you all know. But as a tool, is because it's devastating currently with the supplements we do, with our attempts to diversify diets. This is the poor of the poor that we're addressing with this. And you can look at these numbers, and they scare the hell out of me. Um, one third of children under the age of five around the world have vitamin A deficiency, uh, affecting 670,000 children under five annually. A quarter to a half a million children in developing countries become blind each year. This is with supplementation. So it would be nice to have another tool. And whether you consider this a pharmaceutical or whether you consider this more like conventional breeding, and I didn't, I have a, another couple of slides I used to show that we're already doing this with conventional breeding. We've done it with sweet potato, we've done it with corn, we've done it with cauliflower. It's happening now. Millions of families have benefited from this with conventional breeding. But sometimes the levels are not high enough Sometimes crops like cassava are too hard to breed, and, so, and some, some crops like rice don't seem to have natural diversity for
for vitamin A in, 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 the, in the kernel. So you turn to genetic engineering. So about a half a serving a day would give you enough. And right, I would say, with the same arguments of toxicity, I'd say we should ban carrots and make those pharmaceuticals. You eat too many, you get too much vitamin A. Bad things can happen. Obviously, the public has to learn how to use them. And that's part of the extension education process going on in the Philippines in conjunction with the field trials. And by the way, those field trials that were vandalized, that was organized from Europe activists. That was not local people saying, we don't want vitamin A. So anyway, a, 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 a economist at Berkeley and his team recently estimated what delays have cost. Given that vitamin A, even the earlier forms with lower amounts, you don't need to eat a mountain. That was a green, green piece myth, one of many. Um, if this had been available about 10 years ago, recognizing that we eat things enriched in vitamin A all the time, if we got it out to people and they could read this paper, there are conservative estimates in it, he estimates this 10-year delay that's largely political and regulatory. No, it's not science. It's largely political and regulatory. Uh, about a billion dollars in lost productivity of people who are sick, who can't perform economically. About a million cases of blindness, several hundred thousand deaths. So I can't live with those numbers. Perhaps you can, right? I cannot live with those numbers because I know this rice could be consumed safely if people are educated and there's extension to explain to them what it is. And it probably wouldn't be their only source of, of rice. <coughs> so moving on, problems in management. Here we're going to have more agreement. Um, so we've used this glyphosate resistance. We've gotten these no-till benefits that are quite huge. But we've been so zealous, we as a country, and farmers who save money and control weeds better and simplify their life and go to their kids' soccer game again, because they have one tool, um, and in the companies who sell the seeds, this is money. This is a lot of money fast, because farmers really love this stuff. Uh, we've overused it, we've loved it to death. So now we have lots of cases of uh, Roundup resistant weeds, and I think Monsanto was negligent in stewarding this product forward. I'm angry about that, I've confronted them at conferences and they pretty much own it, that they did not do a good job. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is not good, and now the benefits of glyphosate as, a, as your primary weed control are now being eroded. So, thing to keep in mind about this, this is not good. I don't think anybody would call this sustainable agriculture. We should know better by now to do this smarter. Uh, but it's not new. So this is a little graph from a paper in Nature, one of the preeminent uh, journals of science, talking about uh, herbicide-resistant crops in the past. It's happened many, many times. More than 300 cases are known, independent evolution, and this is now the Roundup case, which is fast. And it's embarrassing. And so we need to figure out how to manage those much, much better. But it's an old problem of agriculture. It's not a new problem. It's been exacerbated by GMOs, unfortunately. Bad management, we agree. Another thing about that, and this is from the USDA report, is that, it, and the, 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 the advantages, ecotoxicology-wise, of herbicide-resistant crops, they can reduce or they can increase herbicide use. They can reduce the ecological toxicity, depending on which herbicide you're using and how much. So this is one case, herbicide-tolerant corn, adopters versus non-adopters. So for many years, they were using less herbicide. Recently, they're using about the same amount of herbicide, and that's probably because they can't just rely on Roundup anymore. So that's an example of the erosion of a benefit that we had earlier. And that is not nice. That is uh, unfortunate. So insect-resistant crops, I think everybody will agree, they've been managed much better, and that's primarily thanks to the Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you, Ray. He's an EPA guy. So, uh, or was an EPA guy. So when you look at insect resistant crops, you can see two things. One is that, yes, resistance is developing here. There's five cases known that have uh, um, uh, economic significance, but they're still very small and isolated. It hasn't been the explosion of issue that it has been for herbicide tolerant crops. As we stack genes, hopefully we can slow this down. But when you look at the billion acres that we've grown, and how we've managed it, this may be about as good as we can do. Maybe we could have done a little better, but every scientist said eventually there'll be resistance developed, just like they do to the antibiotics we use in, med in medicine and veterinary agriculture. So being realistic in the real world of evolution, not in some laboratory, we know we're going to get 
uh, pests develop resistance. The question is, can you manage it smartly so it happens at a, at a rate we're doing better here? So again, perspective, uh, this is not a new, a new problem. A week or two ago, there was a paper in Entomology Today saying, well, it's the 100th anniversary of this. Nothing to be proud of, but it's been going on forever and ever in agriculture. Another issue that concerns me, and this is a, a hypothesis, this is not proven, but I think it's a reasonable one, so I put it up here, is we have done a better job in weed control, uh, the, the resistant weeds notwithstanding, and one of the weeds we seem to have controlled better is the milkweed, and the monarch butterfly depends on the milkweed. So its numbers are very low, there could be lots of reasons for that, including what's happening in Mexico where they overwinter, but a concern by many scientists is that we've driven milkweed populations to such low levels with herbicide tolerant crops that that's threatening the population. And so we may, from my point of view, that wouldn't be a reason to, to ban all GMOs, that would be a reason to manage more smartly. Plant milk, milkweed, pay farmers to have refugia for milkweed, various ta tactics of that sort. I'd love to see, in fact, that is happening already in some localities, planting milkweed along roads. I'd like to see a lot more of that. So the thing that worries consumers the most, individual consumers, not agriculturalists, is, is it safe? Is it killing me? Uh, um, and from my point of view, the reason this has come up is because there have been several studies, both on the GMO and the glyphosate front, and I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, highly publicized. You know, we almost have no science, science journalists in the world. Science journalists from every newspaper I know of, apart from a couple of the New York Times, have been fired. They don't exist. So when a journalist sees information, they can't tell if it's good science, bad science, who even to call to check it out. So in my view, one of the reasons that really bad pieces of science like this one can get so publicized, apart from the fact that he engineered the publicity and is a known anti-GMO advocate for many, many years, um, is, uh, is the structure of our journalism these days and the structure of the media. Anyway, this was a study that many, many scientists said this is really bad toxicology. Right from the get-go, the numbers are too small, statistical analysis is not done. He communicated it unethically by not letting anybody with concerns even see the data until it was out, so on and so forth. And finally, the journal retracted it. Decided, said it was you know, bad enough that it gives no information of value. We're deciding it's not even valid science. So that just shows how bad it was. And there's, there's several studies like that. And, and uh, there's also lots of other myths out there on the internet. We'll talk about one or two more. We've also talked about some. Another one is that GMO crops have promoted suicide in, in, among farmers in India. GMO cotton, insect resistant cotton, it's making them, they're paying so much money for it, they have to mortgage their lives and they kill themselves. It's a myth. People working in India know it's a myth, and you look at data, this is the rate of suicide in India, this is the advent of GMO cotton. No correlation. But it's out there, and most, many people I talk to, people in my classes, assume it's true. It's not. This is from, again, Nature, the same article, but it's in many, many places. So you have all kinds of stuff. In longer talks, I talk about some of the documentaries and the crazy stuff that's in there. No time for that today. So one place, there's many places on the internet you can go, many websites to try to get what I consider to be legitimate scientific information without a strong bias. Here's one that from Professor Parrott that also explains for several of these studies. Here's the one I just told you about that was retracted why uh, he believes, and many scientists believe, the science is just poor and shouldn't be taken seriously. So it's often said that you know all the data is from Monsanto, there's no independent studies. Ray talked about correctly that farmers sign a contract when they use these seeds, when they rent them, they don't buy them, they rent them. That's what Monsanto allows you to do, like it or not. You don't have to do it, but if you're going to get their seeds, you rent them, you don't buy them. That says you won't do research on them. Now, I don't like that very much. I think that's kind of almost constitutionally illegitimate. But it's a contract. It's not, it's not you know, national law. In a contract, you can put anything. And if somebody signs it, pretty much that's the law. So that's what Monsanto has done, and it makes it harder to do independent studies. But a lot of scientists do it anyway. There have been lots of studies that have been done on these commercialized crops. The scientists just, just want to do it, and Monsanto generally won't suffer the bad publicity of suing a real scientist doing studies. And there's a lot of stuff out there anyway. So this is one recent paper looking at the safety of GM crops, uh, food and feed. The, uh, the uh, lower three bars here 
are things that have to do with the composition and the safety of food. Probably 10% or so of those are reviews. They're not independent studies. This would suggest there's something like 30 papers per year, about 300, maybe more, maybe less, that uh, have to do with, with, with uh, safety of food. There's actually a lot more. This is just a 10-year period. There'd be a similar, similar number in the previous 10-year period. And this is what these scientists from Italy say. They say the experimental data collected so far on authorized GE crops can be summarized as follows, no evidence of toxic or allergenic effects. And now, now that doesn't mean we couldn't do something like that, but they've either been not been done by the companies because it would be really bad business, or they've been caught by regulatory and stock. So, so far, the method and the ones we've produced, as far as I can see, appear to be completely safe. The other group that supports that, again, groups of scientists coming together are more powerful than one, two, or three studies, even if they're good studies, um, is to places like this that have come out, the European Commission. Europe is not anti-GMO from a science perspective. It's the political process there that makes it almost impossible to grow GMO crops. The Royal Society of Medicine from the UK, our National Academy of Sciences, American Medical Association, and so forth. And there's more here. Society for Toxicology and so forth. So I think it's true, and I don't really see significant deviation from mainstream science that the current crops are safe. That's how I read it. So I just want to mention very briefly about glyphosate. I'm not a toxicologist, but I teach with a toxicologist. I consult with a chair of toxicology at OSU. I consult with toxicologists around the country. When a paper came, comes out, like Ray talked about, that appears to show that glyphosate is highly dangerous, I say, what's going on? Is this true? Because uh, I'm not in a great position to evaluate it. And, and, and the background to, to that, so so far, I've got no indication any of these new studies are strong enough to say there's really an issue. And you also have to keep in mind as you think about these new studies that Ray talked about, is that there's a mountain of studies already. This is a review by a scientist uh, at, the, at New York Medical College of hundreds of studies of glyphosate, and this is what they write in the summary. Reviews of the safety of glyphosate and Roundup have been conducted by several regulatory agencies and scientific institutions worldwide and have concluded there is no indication of any human health concern. So it's groups of scientists, it's also regulators, people like EPA in the US, in Japan, in the EU, all the people that have allowed it to be used. So there's a mountain of data saying that uh, uh, glyphosate is extremely safe, and you have to get very high concentrations to be concerned, much higher than in the breast milk studies, for example. So, uh, so far, I don't see that this strong scientific consensus has changed. So that's how I, it doesn't mean when you, glyphosate is one of the most widely used, if not the most widely used herbicide in the world. There's a lot of it out there. There's going to be some effects on amphibians or something because it's used so large on such a wide basis. But what's the alternative? What if you tilled up all those acres versus use Roundup? Would the non-target effects be smaller or larger? I suspect much larger. So last comments. I'm sure I'm running out of time. I should be. Yeah, I'm definitely running out of time. Coexistence. So, um, so as Ray said, very correctly, I think, gene flow is ubiquitous in agriculture with or without GMOs. This is just an image of corn from, I think it's Honduras. A farmer is throwing three different colors of corn right next to each other. And yes, they cross pollen. If you look close, you can see in this yellow, down the yellow call, black and white kernels. Uh, nothing is pure, no varieties are pure. FDA has allowances for mold in your food. For insect parts, for feces, nothing is pure. The question is, what's a workable tolerance that we're safe and agriculture is practical? Another thing Ray mentioned that I disagree with strongly, so Monsanto has sued hundreds of farmers and won in every case, mostly out of court, and their farmers have intentionally planted their patented seeds. They have never once, and this was, there was a, a Supreme Court case where they were, they were being sued by the Organic Trade Commission, or OGTA, or whatever that means, against this thing, and, the, and they couldn't find a single case where Monsanto sued for contamination. It was only where the farmer, like Percy Schmeiser, was contaminated and then used the seed and enriched them. That, that's, that's the reason he lost, is he either knew what he was doing or should have known. So uh, the gene flow thing does not allow Monsanto to take over your farm, nor have they ever done that. But that also means if you're selling into a non-GMO market, 
Now you have a new thing you need to do. You need to test for this. You need to see if it's above acceptable levels or not. And that's a new cost imposed on folks who are growing for non-GMO GMO markets. And that's a reality. And I don't like it either. If I was a grower, I'd be pissed as hell. So that's the real consequence of this, not that Monsanto takes over your crop. So this admixture of GMOs and non-GMOs, this is a big thing around the world. Millions and millions of farmers think thinks it gives them benefits. So now we have this hodgepodge of different systems of agriculture, different belief systems, different regulatory systems. So more and more we find GMO stuff and non-GMO stuff and it creates these big trade disruptions that Ray talked about. And it costs us all millions of dollars. So we need to have a smarter way of dealing with that. And he talked about wheat, and I won't talk about that now. That was a very tiny contaminant, but it almost shut down wheat trade in the US over something we knew was safe and was a tiny contaminant. Is that smart regulation? Is that smart trade policies? I think it's not smart at all. We need to have a way to coexist and have tolerances for each other's uh, modes of agriculture. So I'm going to end by just saying, you know, uh, other groups, diverse groups of organic and non-GMO and GMO farmers have gotten together several times, in fact, uh, and reported to the Secretary of Agriculture, much like we're trying to do now with John Kitzhaber, and thought about this. And there's very, very few points of consensus. You know, these really are like different religions trying to talk to each other and come up with a system. So it's very challenging. But I'm going to give you the one quote that they did all agree on. So, uh, all members acknowledge the premise that agricultural practices are diverse and we need to enhance coexistence between all sectors. That's important. They also agree that American farmers have the right to make the best choice for their own farms, including the choice to grow GE, identity preserved IP, non-GE, or organic crops, the choice to practice different agricultural management systems, and the choice to grow crops with many new functional traits, like high antioxidants. So we want all that. We want all that choice and all that freedom. And we all agree that's the way it ought to be. It shouldn't be one way or the other. So finally, to end, these are again my messages. Again, uh, banning or loving GMOs as a group is against science. It's case by case. Think about the science, and Ray made this point very nicely. Separate from the management, we've managed some of these badly. Hopefully, we're going to learn from that. Consider the context. We do crazy things with breathing all the time for benefit. These may even conflict with your ballot measure. Hard point. Be wary of sensationalized science. Few studies. Look at the big picture. Be careful on the internet. We all know that. Coexist. From my point of view, I want to see a healthy organic agriculture sector uh, for all that it brings, uh, but seek solutions that allow everybody to farm. And so if I was voting in this county, I would ask myself, Given the full sweep of all these things, not just herbicide, tolerance, soy, but all these things that are here and coming, and GE is very young, it's only about 20 years old. We haven't even seen uh, all the things that may come. Is it wise to remove this tool from the toolbox? Do you think that's wise for you? Do you think it's a wise signal to the world? Thank you very much. I'm not sure if we have any time left for questions. What time is it? We're about five till. Um, both speakers need to get up to Grants Pass and to speak by six o'clock, but you both have about maybe ten minutes that we can take for questions. Be fine. Yeah. So okay. I stay here or uh, Ray, okay. why don't you come up? Yeah. Okay. So uh, speak your question and who it is for. Um, I'd like you both to address this. I'm in the medical profession. I've seen a lot of gastrointestinal diseases that didn't even exist 20 years ago. Eosinophilic esophagitis, celiac disease, fourfold increase, all these diseases. One of my concerns, which I, Dr. Strapp, both of you related to, was the herbicide use, which um, the EPA apparently what I've read their technical fact sheet, they haven't updated their research since 1990, so that's what, like four years after this stuff kind of hit the market. Um, you know, there's a... What is your question? Uh, <laughs> well, then the EPA last year, like the canola and the soybean oils and stuff, increased the allowable levels 
doubled them. Um, we were talking about potatoes, 200 parts per million up to 6,000 parts per million, not based on science. This is the kind of questions I would like you to address that, you know, you, you say the food's safe or Ray says there's issues here. Talk about that what a little bit. What is your question? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, Dr. Strauss, you say that these foods are great, yet you do comment on the excessive use of the herbicide. So um, I actually had my glyphosate level tested. My daughter, who's a cancer survivor and of childbearing years, was 18 times higher than anybody tested in a similar European study. So where do you go with this information? Yeah, I mean, where I would go with it is I would say, is it above the allowable intake? Which, you know, glyphosate compared to a lot of, like compared to table salt, is, is very low toxicity as an active ingredient. So I wouldn't just say, is it there? I wouldn't say just say, is it tenfold higher? Because tenfold of a tiny number is a tiny number. I would say, is it getting, to, getting close to the acceptable daily intake established by the EPA? And to my understanding, we're still nowhere near it. That's, that's what I've read. But I would also say, as a I would say that this is an issue. Toxicology is not for the faint of heart. And Ray sort of alluded to that. There's a lot of bad studies. You isolate things in a laboratory, it doesn't relate to real, real world exposure. When there's enough of a critical mass that suggests that we have some real concern, Ray thinks there is, I don't see it yet, but I'm mainly deferring to the toxicologist I ask routinely. I don't see the evidence yet. And of course these broad trends, uh, you know, the trend with autism has been linked to GMO food consumption. Well, it's also linked to organic food consumption because that's gone up in parallel. So you can't look at these broad trends you have to do serious science to just sort of tease these yeah. things apart. And, 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 I, and to so me, it hasn't it, been done yet. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, there is sodium levels that are expected to be within a certain range in your body, but there's really no acceptable herbicide levels or expected herbicide levels. No, there are. There are accepted daily intake right. levels, there's, right? Well, there's a, ex, accepted um, resin. Which are a hundredfold, usually less than the point at which you begin to see toxicity in a sensitive model system. The conservatism is built into that ABI acceptable daily intake. So, you know, that's just the way I think about it. Yeah. You'll have to share the mic if Dr. Seid so pass that, pass your lapel mic back and forth. There you go. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, no worries. So that's how I can just wait till I get sick. <laughs> uh, you know, that question comes up at, at every one of these gatherings, and the simple answer is you know, no one in the world really knows for sure at this moment, but let me share a thought or two quickly. Uh, I'm old enough to know about the history of DDT. And we did not know uh, about the health effects from DDT for about 30 or 40 years uh, after World War II, whatever that makes it about in the 1980s. Uh, what we knew at first were the ecological effects. And I think we remember the uh, eggshell thinning uh, impact on the bald eagle, et cetera, et cetera. But now we know that when young ladies prior to puberty, were blasted with DDT when they grew up and became middle-aged and then some they had a five times greater incidence of cancer. And I'm not trying to say we're at the same place with Roundup as we were with DDT in the 1940s or 50s. But I, I guess I'm just trying to say, you know, think about hormone replacement th uh, therapy. Uh, something that came along, I think, in the 70s. And it took a couple of decades to understand whether it was beneficial or harmful. And, or both, it depends. And we really don't know the definitive answer. And what I tried to say earlier, uh, and I didn't get into details, and I don't know, Steve, whether you saw this last paper out of Thailand, okay? Yeah, we all have our biases. Uh, but it's another paper from scientists in another institution in another continent that's raising the same flag as three other scientists in other institutions. You know, Argentina, France, the Seralini deal we know about. Uh, and, the, and the U.S. scientists that did the uh, amphibian studies. And we should be paying a little bit of attention 
to this data and not just, ah, come on, this is not mainstream. How do we know it's not mainstream yet? Let's pay a little bit of attention and go ahead with it. And the reason why I'm mentioning specifically the last paper is that, Steve, uh, these uh, folks did some relatively sophisticated assays and they added estrogen to these breast cancer cell lines and they followed the effect on gene activity. And when they added separately the glyphosate, they found the same perturbations to the same receptor genes with glyphosate as they did with estrogen. And that's a fairly convincing argument. And then when they mixed both the glyphosate and the estrogen, the greater activity of the estrogen was diluted out by the glyphosate, meaning likely that it's the same gene target. You know, we can't just completely ignore this kind of information, but we don't know how to extrapolate to humans yet. So we have some more questions. Uh, you had your hand up first. Oh, yeah. My name is Kent Knock. I'm, I'm not from uh, New York, so I can't talk as fast as you, Dr. Strauss. <laughs> hey, I'm from New York, too, so watch it, guy. <laughs> well, whatever. But I would like to explain this situation. We have a, uh, a Sea Growers Association in this valley. Southern Oregon Sea Growers Association, Saskia. While we were organizing that, uh, that entity, uh, we did have one large chemical company that participated, and they were welcome. And they were welcome. They were absolutely welcome, sir. Yes, I'm being interrupted here. Anyway, while we were trying to organize, they wanted to have 30 votes, or 30 plus, however many seed plots that they managed. Each farmer was going to get one. And when they were told that this was a farmer organization, not a seed uh, company organization, and they would not get 30 votes, they walked out. That I cannot uh, justify as part of coexistence. Can you? Now, I, I don't know the details of the controversies. I've heard various stories about them, so I, I, I don't know enough to comment, but uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Seidler. Uh, early in your presentation, there's been a lot of discussion on yields, although Dr. Strauss disputed whether that was even a relevant issue. But you spent a lot of time talking about yields, and I think both of you have agreed that using the GE crop seeds costs a farmer a lot more. And first, I'd just like to check my understanding for some major crops like corn and soybeans, the market penetration of GE seeds into the marketplaces is huge. I think it's on the order of 90% for corn. Is that true? Correct, yes. So if the yields are not that good, why do smart, independent farmers operated in a free market choose to use GE seeds for corn and soybeans? The yields are not that bad either. They're comparable, number one. And it's not that easy to change anymore. It's a very difficult, very complex process to change. You have to pay more nowadays for seeds that are rare, the non-genetically engineered seeds. And if you want to change to non-genetically engineered seeds and whatever it is that you're paying, you want a product that's non-genetically engineered. So if Mr. Brown Farmer across the street is using a genetically engineered product, as we said earlier, cross-hybridization, a natural process occurs. And here you have a non-GE seed, that product, that's now containing GE seeds from cross-pollination, from the neighbor across the street. Uh, I think you're missing my point. If I'm a farmer, I guess. Okay. if I'm a farmer, I can choose what kind of seeds to buy. And I can buy cheaper non-GE seeds. If there is no improvement in my yield or reduction in my costs, why on earth would I buy GE seeds when I could buy cheaper seeds and make more money. Uh, I can make a comment on that if you want. Ray, when you're ready. Sure. Got this thing. Uh, just a couple of things about yield that are complicated. One is that uh, what's happened is there's so much GE corn now 
that the pest populations have been suppressed throughout the Midwest, and there's really great data on that. And so it's really hard to compare GE and non-GE, the data that Ray showed, because the GE has made it that the, the benefits are, are, are region-wide. So the non-GE is benefiting, too, from the pest resistance trait, because they have lower populations. So those comparisons now are not as meaningful as they were in the early days. The other thing that farmers get from this is insurance. It's insurance against a yield loss. And so it's kind of like, think of it as an insurance. They may not get better yield every year, but they have confidence if there's an insect outbreak they can't predict, they're protected. So they bought that insurance policy. And in fact, there is a, there's some recognition of, of insurance companies that they get uh, lower crop insurance rates because they've added this kind of risk-reducing element to their crop by having the GE. So that's another complicating factor in there. Uh, and the reason a farmer might buy it, even if the yield benefits are not that great anymore, or they're not guaranteed every year. Can I, Mary, where are you? Right here. Can I make a quick comment, promise? Uh, okay, I, I wanted to make a comment about Steve's presentation about the yields in developing countries versus the U.S. No control experiments were done. We don't know if the folks that were using the genetically engineered, whatever, let's say corn, that got the 29% increase in the yield, 29% from what they got the previous year. Well, how did they change their agronomic um, uh, practices? Did they use the same variety or did seed companies say, hey, I've got a hybrid variety that is so hot, use it. It naturally didn't matter if it was genetically engineered or not. It was going to yield more. So I thought I need to see some control experiments that show the fertilizer was the same, the water was the same, the variety of the seed was the same, and so on. So I take the 29% increase as hmm, interesting, but that's all. So we've got a question here. I have a question for Dr. Strauss regarding DDT. Dr. Seidler mentioned DDT uh, uh, as, a, as an example, and I wanted to, to address that. Uh, like the uh, spotted owl in the desert tortoise, I understand that the studies from DDT creating uh, much thinner uh, eggshells has been debunked, and as a result of uh, banning DDT, millions of children in developing worlds are dying of malaria because they don't have access to DDT. Could you, could you elaborate on that, please? Wow. Yeah, I'll give you my understanding, mainly from seeing toxicologist colleagues of mine lecture on this. So, to my understanding, the DDT impacts on humans remain extremely small and marginal, contrast to what Ray said, but the impacts on birds and their eggshells are, are near certain. And that's the reason we ban DDT, is because of wildlife concerns primarily. And it is, there's a very nice article in National Geographic, in fact, a few years back, showing when worldwide concern, the thought was, well, if we ban DDT here, why shouldn't we ban it globally? Why should we treat the developing world differently? And we did ban it, and the rate of malaria just skyrocketed. I mean, it's an amazing peak. And then when it was reintroduced, they came back down. And so I think you're right about that, is that our policies imposed on the developing world had severe costs. And so now it's back. And the challenge, like we talked but there's also lots of DDT-resistant mosquitoes. Right. So the challenge is using it smartly, yeah. like treating bed nets, treating the perimeters of homes, not spraying it broadcast year after year. That will not work in the long run. But yes, having it back in there has saved millions of lives. I didn't realize it was back. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it is back on a, on a more limited basis, yes. So she has First of all, I'd like to thank both of you. Um, I think talk into the mic. Hold I'm a little nervous. Excuse okay. me. Um, I think we miss the whole point of GMO. If you stick BT and uh, weed resistance into it, we eat it. We either wear it on our skin or we eat it. I don't think it's been out long enough that you can say that it's great stuff. I just don't think so. Because what happens is, even with cotton, cottonseed meal is fed to cattle. We eat the, we eat the beef. And the, the permanence of everything, I think, is very, very bad. I think they're going to prove in another 10 years that it's terrible. 
and I think you missed the point that GMO for medical purposes, they, they're conquering cancer with, with, with genetic modification. And fixing trees, great idea. Right. They get rid of the, the viruses and that kind of stuff. I think that's great. But messing with our food is a whole nother ball What's your question? <laughs> Address it. What's the question? The question is, <coughs> how do we get around having all the BT and the resistance to all this stuff in our food? Because we get it in our food, <coughs> whether we like it or not. How do we get it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great, and I think people have a, a lot. Of, oops, a lot of people have the same concerns, and I'll just tell you how scientists and toxicologists and EPA thinks about this and tries to make decisions. Obviously, we can't do long-term long trials on humans and be sure it's safe, right? That's not ethically allowable. Well, I'm just saying we can't do it before we put it into the marketplace. So, so you set up these margins of safety. You study the isolated elements. Right, and you, you, you do high dose studies to try to see if you can have an effect at very high doses in various animal systems. Uh, you look at current use, like you've used BT as an organic spray for years, and you do eat it. There's residues from organic and conventional agriculture of all these pesticides, organic and not. It's all toxic at high doses. See, one thing about toxicology, the dose makes the poison. Almost every, everything is toxic at a high enough dose. Almost nothing is toxic at a low enough dose. And so the question is, what's the dose? And so you do these high dose studies, and you don't allow things into the marketplace that don't have a very high margin of safety. And yes, sometimes they'll make a mistake, but the question is, how do you go forward? The scientists and regulatory agencies make these calculations of benefit, how much insecticide won't we spray, that's now creating a problem, versus risk. How much risk is there given the toxicity? And the, and the other thing they'll take into account is the mechanism of action. So BT is not a toxin to us. We could eat a huge amount because we don't have the alkaline gut and we don't have the receptors for the toxin. So again, the knowledge of how it works, in addition to the toxicology, the dose studies, help regulators come to a decision without doing long-term studies. And my guess is they're right 99% of the time, but not 100. The question is, how do you go forward? What about cell phones? There's still lots of questions about those. Again, risk-benefit balancing is what we do. Hope that helps. Thank you. So Before I forget, I want to publicly thank Steve for coming down here. He's a working guy, I'm not. And Tom and Mary for putting all of this together and bringing us all together. Labeling. It's not just printing the label, it's the cost of separate tracking and storage systems. It's the risk of <coughs> making consumers concerned when there's been far more science about these GM than there has been with conventional crops. As I told you, we mess with all kinds of aspects of their safety and health in conventional breeding. So it's the cost and it's the notion that it's misleading. We also have a labeling system today in the U.S. Those oils I mentioned are going to have healthier oils, like with the soy that's like olive oil. And that will be labeled. Is healthier, or are they the, well, we expect that it to they are be. GMO. They're GMO, but they're high oleic acid. We expect that they're healthier, but they will still have to be labeled because they're different than conventional soy. What's what we're not labeling is the GE process. We're labeling the product, and scientists again, pretty much everywhere, conclude it's the product, not the process, that matters. And in the U.S., we label the process, I mean, excuse me, the product when it's significantly different. Yeah, so we have labeling in a sense. That is significantly different. Well, if the dose is very low, then it's not. So that's to be their conclusion. I have members in my family who 